good evening and welcome. I'm Rachel Zukowski, Program Services Manager at Prince George's County Memorial Library System. Tonight, we are honored to host author Morgan Rogers for a conversation about her debut novel, Honey Girl. She will be interviewed by Vanessa Chandler, Library Associate 2 at Spalding's Library Branch, and Isaiah West, Teen Services Specialist. Honey Girl was named Most Anticipated of 2021 by Oprah Magazine and other notable publications. It is an emotional, heartfelt, charming debut, and I loved every moment of it, says Jasmine Guillory, New York Times bestselling author of The Proposal. Morgan Rogers is a queer Black millennial. She writes books for queer girls who are looking for the place in the world. She lives in Maryland with her five dogs and a cat. You can borrow the book from PGCMLS at pgcmls.info or purchase a copy from loyalty bookstores. And I will put that link in the chat shortly. Here is a synopsis of the book. When becoming an adult means learning to love yourself first. With her newly completed PhD in astronomy in hand, 28-year-old Grace Porter goes on a girl's trip to Vegas to celebrate. She's a straight A, work through the summer certified high achiever. She is not the kind of person who goes to Vegas and gets drunkenly married to a woman whose name she doesn't know, until she does exactly that. This one moment of departure from her stern ex-military father's plans for her life has Grace wondering why she doesn't feel more fulfilled from completing her degree. Staggering under the weight of her parents' expectations, a struggling job market and feelings of burnout, Grace flees her home in Portland for a summer in New York with a wife she barely knows. In New York, she's able to ignore all the constant questions about her future plans and falls hard for her creative and beautiful wife, Yuki Yamamoto. But when reality comes crashing in, Grace must face what she's been running from all along, the fears that make us human, the family scars that need to heal and the longing for connection, especially when navigating the messiness of adulthood. And now I'll turn the presentation over to our hosts and special guests, Morgan Rogers. We hope you will all enjoy. Welcome, Morgan. We're so glad you're here today with us. Um, this is so exciting. This is your first published book. Um, it's been received with so much overwhelming praise and wonderful reviews. Um, what's the experience been like for you, the newly published author, to encounter such an what seems like an overnight success? I don't know. Was it actually an overnight success? Um, I don't know if I would say that. Um, but it's been surreal. I mean, everyone's been very um, supportive and um, uplifting. And I feel like the book is really reaching the audience that it was written for and it's connecting with the people that it, it's meant to find. So it's been really great to kind of see it, it make its way into the world and, and find its place. So it's been, it's been good. I wish it was an overnight success. I don't know what that entails, but. <laughs> <laughs> How long did you actually work on this, this book? Um, I started writing it at the beginning of 2019, um, so right in January. Um, I finished it maybe May, um, queried it over the summer, and I got my agent in August, and then we got the book deal in November of that year, 2019. So it was all within that year. Um, and then I spent some of last year doing like the final edits and everything for it. There are a lot of jealous, aspiring writers out there who are listening to this. That is amazing. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, I, it obviously does not happen like that um, usually. So I was very, very uh, privileged to have that be my experience. Yeah, I was going to say, not just aspiring authors are probably envious of that. I think there are some authors that have gone through the process that might be envious as well. Uh, so how did you get started writing? Um, well, I started writing in fan fiction, really, like in, in high school and college, I was really, still really, but I um, was into fandoms and I kind of cut my teeth on writing and, and showing the entire internet. And when you do that, you get very used to uh, criticism and everyone's opinions. So it's, and it's good because you really get to hone your skills and you get to learn from so many different authors and writers. 
Um, and most of them were, were older than me um, at the time. So it's people that had a lot more experience. Um, so I got to kind of figure out my voice, but while also having people be like, eh, this could be better. <laughs> um, so it was very humbling, um, humble beginning. So yeah, it was, it was great though. So I feel like that comes through in my work. A lot of like the tropes, I mean, the married in Vegas is such a popular trope. So I feel like it comes through. What were some of these fandoms that? Oh, wow. Um, don't expose me. So definitely like, I was really big into One Direction in college. All my friends could attest. Um, <laughs> I really like, um, that was probably, that was a big one. Um, a few anime ones, um, that's, that's all probably I'm gonna uh, say. If Fair enough. Know, yeah. Fair enough. Now I have heard that music is a, one of your sources of inspiration for writing. Is, uh, so can you tell us about how music impacts your like creative process? Yeah, I'd actually say music is probably my number one um, sort of like creative well. Um, I'm listening to music constantly. If I'm not asleep, then I'm listening to music. Um, so I feel like it, it affects my writing because I write, it's almost like a rhythm. So the words kind of have to follow a specific beat. There has to be a certain number of words in a sentence. When you read it aloud, it kind of has to flow in that kind of way that a song does for me. That's how it goes through my brain. Um, and I think that's because I just, I'm just constantly absorbing music from so many different genres and countries. And so it's it's probably my number one thing that I, that I go to. Did you, you think about adding a playlist to your- Yeah, there is a playlist for, for Honey Girl. Mm. Um, and also a few readers have made playlists as well. Um, but as I was writing, I had a playlist. And then after I was done, I made a playlist. Um, when I'm not working, I think making playlists is my full-time job, so. Wow. <laughs> Do you always listen to music when you write? Or is there like a certain time that you're just like, no, total zone of silence? I never have silence, ever. <laughs> I just love it. Like, I just love listening to songs. Like, that's just, I just can't, especially now, like in the pandemic and being home, I think my Spotify usage has increased. So all day I'm in my house and the speakers are just blasting and I'm sure my neighbors are very tired of me, <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> this is my life. What's on the playlist these days? Yeah. It's been a lot of Bad Bunny. Um, I support that. And then that. also Selena, like, uh, like the original Selena, not Selena Gomez. <laughs> um, um, so they've been in heavy rotation. Um, Rina Sawayama is really great. Um, the new Demi Lovato album I've had on repeat. So it varies. Kind of very like cross yeah. genre too. Yeah. If it sounds good, I'm going to listen to it. I don't even have to understand the words. Sounds like my playlists. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, this makes me think about, um, especially in the, in the very beginning of the book, when you're getting hooked to the, the grace is realizing that something happened that's a little different. And that the, the language you use is so lyrical and so poetic. And is that something that's special to you? I'm thinking about music lyrics and the book that all kind of intertwine together. Yeah, I think yeah. that's how I've been influenced. So my just exorbitant amount of exposure to music has kind of influenced how I write. Um, so it just kind of comes out automatically like that at this point. Um, and I'm constantly kind of listening to it, like reading it back as I'm writing to make sure it it sounds right. Um, not just reads right, but it has to sound right in my head. So yeah, it, it was so visual and you and, you know it had smells and it was it was lovely. I Thank enjoyed you. the book. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, let's get into the book just a little bit, because this was quite the unique and interesting story for me to read. Um, I've definitely read the trope of, you know, getting drunk and getting married in Vegas, but like everything 
that went along with that was just such an inspirational read. Um, so why did you want to tell this story? Why, why drunk and married in Vegas? So that's one of my favorite tropes. I just find it fascinating, but I've never kind of seen it queer and specifically lesbians and then specifically lesbians of color. So I was like, okay, how can I make this as close to me as possible? Um, so I originally it was gonna be just like a romance novel um, just two girls drunk, married in Vegas, and then figuring out their lives together. Um, but then once I kind of um, realized Grace's background, her job and everything, it kind of became more her story and then how she fit in this marriage um, in between all that and kind of what drove her to staying married to a stranger that she she met in Vegas in the first place. So interesting. I mean, you could definitely tell that there were romance story elements in there. Is that a genre that you see yourself kind of gravitating towards? Um, it's really hard to write a romance novel. Like I'm kind of in awe of romance authors because I set out to do that. And then I was like, how did they like it's really good? <laughs> Um, so I would love to. That's what I read the most of, I feel like, is romance. So it's definitely an influence of mine. But it's really, really difficult. Um, so maybe maybe eventually I will gain the, the skills to do it. Well, I still thought it was a very romantic title. Maybe not romance itself, but there was definitely a romantic element to it. Yeah, I agree. Thank yeah, you. even... Even the cover, I don't know if you can see this very well, the um, the cover incorporates all the, the language you use to describe her honey tones and the golden, and it was just, it's beautiful. The cover is great. Poppy Magda was the, the cover artist and she's amazing. And I think that the cover art ended up being like the first or second draft. Like it was very early in the process that we were like, this is it, okay, no more. They captured it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, really great. So you told us about your work schedule, how you, you basically put this book together from start to finish in eight, six, eight months, six months? I can't six count. Six months, yeah. And so what was your, was that like furiously writing every day or was it? Yeah, a so I, effort? I made a goal of writing at least 200 words every day um and so that was just the minimum that i needed to hit so i did that every day and usually i could go over that but on the days when writing's like really hard which is most days um like if you can just hit that 200 like you feel like you've done something um and it's like an accomplishment so that was really my goal just to get some word on the page every day so yeah i was doing that and i was in i was writing with a lot of friends too so they were writing their own things we were in like virtual rooms and watching each other's word count go up and so it was a, it was definitely like a community thing a community process that sounds wonderful yeah it's great well speaking of friends um i feel like the friendships in this book um so grace and her friends they were they're so close and they were so loving and generous toward each other and they had such a great rapport um, I feel like um, friendships must be quite important to you, but the way that you wrote these friends, like they were so lifelike. Like I felt like I knew them from the beginning, even though like they were clearly secondary characters, like they weren't, they weren't the star at all. But like, as soon as they came onto the page, they were, they were your friends too. Did you, did you kind of borrow personality traits and things like that from people you know? Not consciously, but a lot of people have said that. And so looking back, I feel like I have kind of taken bits from my friends, especially um, like the New York bits. Um, one of my best friends, when I was writing the novel, I went up to New York to visit her at the time. And I usually would go up like two or three times a year. So I got a lot from there um, and just like, the kind of unconditional love um, that you get from your friends and I get from my friends that I'm really like thankful to have. 
Um, I just kind of wanted to infuse that in them, especially because like, I feel like for queer people, especially that kind of found family or chosen family is really important because you don't always have the support of your your biological family or or whatever, or even if you do, they don't really know the the lifestyle and you know the things that you go through as a queer person. Um, so I feel like you learn a lot from your queer friends and you get like accountability and new perspectives and and that that love and care from your own community. So I wanted to make sure that was present in the book. Yeah, well, that that's another aspect that was. Uh, interesting, heart-wrenching, I don't know how you want to describe it, but the fact that the found family and chosen family, they were just so close, so strong, but then you had this kind of cold um, home environment. Um, so I guess what I'm interested in knowing is kind of what were your reasons in like kind of giving that juxtaposition of um, these warm, loving, open friends, and then this like almost sterile, like home life. See, I don't know that I would use those words to describe like Grace's dad and her relationship with her parents. I think it's more like how trauma manifests in people and in generational um, relationships and, and how our parents' baggage can be passed on to us. Um, like for Colonel, I mean, specifically talking about him, like he was recruited into the military very early and he kind of says, um, you know, it wasn't his dream to be in the military, but that was his way kind of out of his situation. Um, and that was really the only option that he had. So it's kind of commentary on, on how the military kind of preys on these communities like that. Um, so he's a person that kind of had this structure drilled into him and he's in war, he has PTSD, he lost his leg and he doesn't want his daughter to ever feel that sort of out of control um, that he felt that he needed someone else to lift him out of. He wants Grace to kind of really have her, her future nailed down and, and holding firm to it and not needing to depend on anyone else um, for success or for stability. Um, so I think that that manifests that way with them. And, and I think, I don't think ever Grace ever questions that he loves her or that he's there for her. I don't know that. That's why I don't know that cold is the right word, but rather, um, yeah, like I said, it's, it's trauma and it's, and it's figuring out how to, how to heal and talk to your parents and figure out what your boundaries are with them and how you communicate with them, I think. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that makes totally. total sense. Yeah. Totally. Um, and I think it's also very interesting, like, you know, inherited trauma is something that is talked about a lot, um, especially within the queer community. Um, but I think it's just very interesting the way that I chose to, to read that um, was just probably more of just against my upbringing rather than seeing it through your lens, which is probably a different experience. So, yeah. It makes sense, yeah. And your book touched on so many different topics. You've got the super close friendships, the family relationships, and I don't think any, there's few of us who have family relationships that don't have some sort of complication or things that make life a little spicy. <laughs> but um, you touched on, you know, the queer issue. You've got all, you know, multiracial, people um, and mental health issues. And I found it, without giving too much away, it interesting and great to, because in our community, in the black community, often seeking outside help, it's like, oh, I'll just pray on it. Or, yeah. you know, I've heard so many ways people deflect going to talk to somebody. I don't need to talk to anybody. And they really need to go talk to somebody. Yes. But um, it was nice to see it kind of, um, portrayed as not a scary, crazy thing to do. It's just another thing, another thing in your toolkit to manage with your life. And was that something that you intentionally, well, brought up to, to, to dig into that way? Yeah, I mean, I wanted therapy and mental illness and mental health to be as normalized as possible because these are things that, that plague people like every day. Um, 
And so I, I mean, I have that experience. I have friends that have those experiences. So this is something that we just kind of go through and it's not um, shameful. It's not, you know, taboo. It's not hush hush. Like you go to the doctor, you go to your therapist. Sometimes you need medication, you know, these are just a part of the things that, that heal you and, and um, make your health better. Um, so I wanted to really showcase that, especially like making sure you have the right therapist, um, finding a therapist that works for you and your situation and feeling safe to be vulnerable with them. Um, so yeah, it was definitely intentional um, with that. And just with the mental illnesses, both Grace's and Agnes's and, and showing the different ways that they can manifest and it doesn't really demonize a person. It just makes them, um, it's just a different perspective. It's, it's a struggle. It's something that they survive and, and live with and heal from. I thought it was wonderful. Thanks. <laughs> and it was handled um, with careful hands. It was definitely not a heavy handed approach, which is refreshing to see. Yeah, I definitely didn't want to preach. You know what I mean? Um, but I just wanted to have it there. Yeah. I just, yeah, normalized, like you said. Just yeah. it's part, it's part of life, not a major part of the story itself. Right. Um, so clearly this book is, takes place in someone's late twenties, like mid to late twenties. I don't know where you want to put 28. It's clearly late twenties, but some people like to hold on to the mids as long as possible. Um, but I feel like the themes in this book, like span generations, like it's themes that so many people, um, are going to struggle with and deal with and interact with, um, who was your intended audience for this book? So I don't think I really thought about that until I was done. As I was writing, the intended audience was just me and one of my friends that was reading it as I was writing it. And I was just like, is this good? Um, but now I feel like it's, it's, it's very, I hate this word, but it's very timely um, because where we're at in the pandemic and, and quarantine and just like, the world, people are are yearning for connection and and wanting to be heard and understood. And they have these kind of dark parts that they feel like they have to hide and aren't accepted, especially marginalized people. Um, so the book, the intended audience is people that are, are lonely creatures that are pushed to the shadows that feel like um, they're the scary thing that, that people tell stories about. Um, it's for people that feel like that. And it's to say that it's okay to be those things. And just because someone is afraid of you, afraid of your existence, doesn't actually mean you are scary. You are something to be feared. It just means that you threaten them. And I feel like that can be a good thing. Good statement. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> Definitely see where the writing comes from now. <laughs> Uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe I was thinking about this before, I don't know. <laughs> I, if you didn't, like, you have put so much thought into it now, like, that was so eloquently stated. Like, you, you. didn't you didn't stumble at all. <laughs> I, was, I was made for this moment right here. <laughs> <laughs> well, in thinking about your writing, it sounds like you've been writing in one way or another for a long time. Um, are there any, do you have any favorite authors or anybody who inspired you to want to write? Or was it just something that was always just bubbling up out of you? Um, I mean, I've been writing for as long as I can remember. I would write on like my mom's yellow legal pads. I would write stories and, and take them to school and my friends would illustrate them. When I, growing up, I definitely read a lot of like Beverly Cleary and um, like a lot of the, you know, like the old school authors. And I was always like, oh, these are, so relatable to me as I was like nine years old and life was like horrible. Um, and then, <laughs> um, so I think just kind of like growing up and, and I would read everything. My grandparents would take me to Barnes and Noble every Saturday and my grandma would just make my granddad give me some money and I'd go on Barnes and Noble and pick out whatever I wanted. They didn't even look at the books so I could have been getting anything. And I would just get a stack of books and read them. Um, so I, I just read a lot. Um, now less so, which is terrible, but um, 
I definitely have read The House in the Cerulean Sea really mm -hmm. like hit me hard. Like that tenderness and, and care that goes into a book, I feel like really came out in that. And that definitely made me want to make sure that I put that into what I write. Um, also, what I really loved was Gideon the Ninth because the characters just come off the page. Like it doesn't feel like you're reading them. It's like you're watching this come to life. Um, so it's it's so surreal and and the writing is so unique. So I definitely am in awe of books like that. Um, now I definitely am really into like Leah Johnson, like You Should See Me in the Crown, um, Happily Ever Afters by Elise Bryant. Um, I like like feel good books. I like comfort books. So those are I good. think I think this year in particular, or this year plus all of 2020, comfort comfort is a big thing for yeah. all of us because there's a lot going on going out in that world that we have no control over. Yeah. So it's nice to have those books that make you feel very like warm and, and hopeful. Yes, hope. Hope keeps us all alive, yes. Yes. Yes, all, all those titles um, were so good. I'm glad that you mentioned some of them and gave gave some a shout out. Yes, definitely. Are you reading anything right now? Right now, what do I have? Um, this Close to Okay by Lisa Cross Smith. I was waiting for that book for so long and then Pandemic Brain got to me and I'm like, just let me read it. I want like... I had it delivered to me as soon as it came out. And I'm just like, as soon as I have the attention span, I'm putting it in my eyeballs. So that's at the top. And also Legendborn, mm. um, like everyone talked about how good it was. And I'm like, I'm the last person on earth to read it. So I'm really excited to read Not that. the last. It's, <laughs> not, it's on my pile too. It just keeps, bumping down one because I'm like, ah, fantasy. Like I love fantasy most of the time, but I haven't been able to get into it during the pandemic for some reason. I've heard so. the world building is really good, but it might be just too much for me right now. But it's definitely like, as soon as I come back online, as soon as this windows turn back <laughs> in, I'm, <laughs> I'm ready. So, so what is your life like now? Are you, you're this aspiring, well, they're not even aspiring. You're an author who is there, who came from, I guess, relative obscurity as far as the rest of the world knowing about you to everybody knows about your book, Morgan Rogers and Honey Girl. What's that? So do you walk down the street and people know who you are? <laughs> well, one, I'd be wearing a mask. Like, one, I'd be wearing a mask. <laughs> um, so, yeah. But it's weird that, like, people know who I am in any capacity now, um, especially for something I feel like is so personal because writing a book is so personal. Um, so the fact that it's kind of just out there, like I had um, Felicia Day, um, like made a post on Instagram and was like, I just read this book, Honey Girl, it was so great. And I'm like, why do you know that it exists? <laughs> You've been on TV, like why do you, why do we even exist in the same sphere? I feel like you have other bigger, better things, but it was very weird. But yeah, so it, it, it's strange. Just like authors who books, whose books that I've read and they're like, I'm really excited for your book. And I'm like, why do you know? No, how did you, this even get on your radar? So, yeah. I mean, yeah. because you were put on the most anticipated reads of like every yeah. magazine known to man. <laughs> no, and I still get like, I feel it feels fake that Jasmine Guillory is on the front of the cover at, with a blurb. There's no way she read that. <laughs> and she went on the Today Show and she shouted it out. I'm like, now people on the Today Show know about it? It's just so weird. Are you are you looking for the Jenna's Book Club stamp? Jenna, call me. Jenna, Reese, hello, <laughs> I'm here. I'm available. I love a book club. We'll, we'll just keep, we'll just all tweet that. Yeah. We'll make, we can make that happen, right? We can make that happen. Yeah. Everybody watching, tweet at Jenna Bush Hager. If you have her number, just, just text her. Let her know I'm here. Speaking of that, do you have a presence on social media where we can follow you and you can... I have a presence. I, I need to leave social media. It's bad. Um, I'm on Twitter. 
I'm on Instagram less just because I'm like at that age where it feels like I'm too old to understand how to work it, but I am on there <laughs> and I'm on Twitter. Both of my handles are Garnet Morgue, like Morgue is in the cemetery. Um, Garnet as in the, um, my birth uh, jewel. Oh, your birthstone. Yeah, my birthstone. Yeah, that. Um, so I'm there on both of those platforms. And I have to ask this. So you've got, you're great at setting a goal for yourself, just like Grace and doing your certain number of words every day. Are you already pumping out books number two, three, four, and five? If only. So 2019 was, was really a year. It was the last year, um, I feel like. <laughs> so um, it's been really difficult for me to write. And I, I try to be kind of open about that because I know that sometimes people feel like published authors are just home and they're just writing all day. And I'm like, I am not Nora Roberts. Like, <laughs> that's a struggle over here. Um, yeah, it's really it's really been difficult to create. So I am I am writing not definitely not three, four, and five, but two <laughs> is definitely coming. Um and so hopefully my brain will kind of align with the way of the world. But I feel like I'm trying to give myself grace because we're in a time of like turmoil and and grief constantly and there's always things on the news so i'm trying not to be like you need to be productive right now mm -hmm. um because that's i feel like that would be me being grace porter and that i just wrote a book about not doing that exactly now thinking about the you have a lot of different types of situations that come out in the book how did you do the the research. I know you said you went to New York where your friend was, but did you find yourself having to dig deep for a lot of the other content? Mm, yes, definitely for Yuki's radio show. Um, her stories, I definitely, and especially like the ones that she pulls from Japanese culture and like the yokai, um, I definitely wanted to make sure that I was presenting those um, as best as I could um, because she's kind of sharing that with her readers and, and pulling them into her culture that way. Um, also astronomy, because I, I enjoy it, um, in a very layman sense. And then when I wrote it and I, I queried it, my agent was like, you know what this needs? It needs more astronomy. And I was like, how interesting that you say that. I don't think so. Um, so I had to do a lot of research into that. Um, and figuring out just like what to put in there. Cause I'm like, I don't know. There's math involved in astronomy. That's absurd. So I definitely had to, to go to Google a lot. I took astronomy in college thinking that it would be easier than other sciences. And I was extremely disappointed <laughs> when I realized that it was like chemistry and geology and physics. <laughs> yeah, it's very hard. So I, I, did, I did some research, but not too much that I would feel like this feels like I'm failing college, so. It didn't give me like horrible flashbacks. So, so then I succeeded. Yes, <laughs> it was it was enjoyable tidbits of astronomy <laughs> rather than me trying to map out what the light looks like from right. neon. <laughs> yeah. And the Japanese mythology was it, is it mythology that some of the stories that uh, were told? Um, one that stuck with me was because the visuals you portrayed very well were the there were the old women who were shunned by the ah yes the who, who would t yeah eat babies <laughs> yeah that was, that was I was disturbing yeah it was just so interesting like because I was just looking at different stories and then I could see how they could be connected now like when you think about that story and women who can't have babies, so of course they're relegated to the the top of the mountain and they come down to eat everyone else's children like. You're just like, okay, I see exactly how this came about and how it relates to even modern society now. And so Yuki kind of has that same thought process of, of connecting those stories to the now. This is fascinating, but a little bit frightening too. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely nightmares for someone. <laughs> That's why it comes on at midnight, her show, so. Fair enough. People are already not asleep, so. 
Uh, I would like to know who your favorite character is, because some authors say that they don't have one, but other authors clearly have favorite characters. Do you, does it come across in the book that I have? No, one? I don't think so. You don't think so? I couldn't tell. No, I mean, it does... Like, I don't know. I'm going to let you answer no, that. No, I'm curious to know. <laughs> I mean, I definitely think that the way that... Um, you write Yuki uh -huh. makes her seem like you favor her, but I, I'm not really sure if that's fair because the parts that feels like you're favoring her are the parts where she is admiring Grace and talking to and oh, about yeah. Grace. So that's like, it, interesting. yeah, like, but I feel like she gets a lot of really great lines. And... That's actually really good. I She's not my favorite, but I relate the most to her. She was the easiest to write. Um, so that's probably why it comes like that. Raj is my favorite character. I like Raj. I almost said that, but I was like, but he's got a smaller part. Yeah, but I just, he's stubborn and he's like kind of mean, but he's really kind hearted and he cares a lot but also he's bitter and also he cares so much about his family, but he wants what he wants. He wants, you know, um, not to have to own this tea shop like his dad, but he's still very loyal to his family. He has all these different combinations and contradictions and I adore him. Then no, I would not have guessed that actually. But it's, so. the thing, it's funny that you said Yuki because she was very much the easiest to write. So that's probably why. That's probably why it came through. But yeah, it was just some of the lines, like even at the very beginning, like calling her honey girl, I was just like, oh, she's just a character that I, I need to know. She knows how to speak. Like she would <laughs> sweep me off my feet for sure. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of her medium, um, you know, talking to people and reaching people. So I'm glad. Can you hear, oh. I'm sorry, can you hear my dog having a great time in the background? Oh, okay. I know you had five of them, so I thought it was pretty quiet, considering. Oh, well, that's good. If you can't hear it, that's fine. Then it's just me. I hear, No, I hear a little squeak occasionally. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm squeak. Squeak. I thought maybe it was a gerbil, but a dog. <sighs> no, there are no rodents in the air. So are your, are your, what are your dogs named after? Um... Are they themed? They have really bougie names. I have Nico, um, I have London, Princeton, um, Bella, and Chloe. Oh, and okay. the cat? Grace. Grace. Oh, she, the she cat's name really, Grace. She came as that. I, I adopted her last year, and her name was already Grace. So I was like, oh, this is my cat. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's yeah. fate right there. Yeah. If fate totally. exists. That is yeah. proof. Huh. So I did want to ask, we kind of moved out of it, but I'm still curious to know um, which like acclaim meant the most to you? Uh, or maybe you don't keep track of all of them. I don't know, but um, I know I would, so. No, um, I definitely, every time I get an email, I'm like, this is absurd. Um, which one meant the most? I would say, honestly, you know what I would say? And it's not even really like a claim, but I guess it is the audiobook, because not every author gets an audiobook. So the fact that I did, um, and the fact that it was so well done and it captured the story so well, um, I felt like that was peak for me. Um, so yeah, the audiobook, which sounds ridiculous considering everything else but yeah that was my number one thing it's true though like a lot especially debut authors and adult fiction uh, you know in the sub romance like they don't typically get it like right away and yours came right. out same day okay. so i was so lucky so and it for it to be so good i'm like this is this is peak for me it is. I highly suggest those of you watching that are like number 412 on the wait list at PGCMLS. Um, if 
you see the audiobook available, it is worth the mm-hmm. listen. That's how I that's how I read this one, and I'm glad that I did. I thought that the voice was just done perfectly. Yeah. I love it so much. And I promise I will return my paper copy tomorrow so some lucky person can have this one pretty soon. <laughs> Maybe I'll listen to it again or listen to it. I read it. Maybe I'll listen to it on audio. Yeah. That was also something I did. I didn't really consider when I got published, but someone tagged me and they were like, just picked it up from the library. And I was like, wait, that's right. People can do that. <laughs> oh my gosh. It was just so cool thinking about someone just walking the library and being like, I want to borrow this book. I was like, oh my gosh. Yeah, you have a whole long line of people at the library waiting to get your book. I it didn't even really sink in for me until I saw it in like the library barcode was on it. I was like, oh my gosh, wow. Well, that makes us feel good to know that authors feel like they have it made when their book is at the yeah. library on the shelf. It's so cool to see that, honestly. Where was the first place you saw your book? Um. Like in a store, I guess. I went to, so I used to work at Barnes and Noble. So I went to my Barnes and Noble on release day and I signed some copies there. So that was the first place I saw it, which, and it was on like a display table. I'm like, wow, I used to organize these tables. (laughs) I labored here for minimum wage for, for like six years. And now my book is here. So that's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, I can't even imagine that. Like, that really is full circle. It was very cool. And, like, some of the people that I used to work with are still there. So it was, like, getting to see. Like, they knew me when I was, like, a really obnoxious teenager. And so to <laughs> go back and be, like, now I'm an obnoxious public author. So. And you're like, bring it's me water. Cool. Bring me water. Okay. <laughs> it's a glow up, definitely. That's amazing. I am so happy for you for this success. This is just um I mean, it sounds like you definitely worked for it, but it came, you know, you weren't shopping your your manuscript around for years. So everything fell into place with this book. Um, Everything that was meant to happen seems to have happened. So I'm really grateful for that. Do you still love it? Yes, it's definitely not the story I would tell now, but it was definitely the story that I needed to tell at the time. So I love it for that. Um, and then I feel like I kind of captured that time in my life and, and what was kind of going through my head. Um, so yes. Do you read through any parts no. of it? No. Oh, you never read it? No. I oh. read it when I first got like the arts, like the early editions. And I was just like, there's so many things I want to change. <laughs> so- <laughs> that was my next question was like, do you read through it and just see everything that you want yes. to make I'm different? Like, Okay, we could have definitely done something different here, but that's fine. Well, I can't see it, so. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, it's perfect just the way it is, but I can understand how you'd always want to go and change your life. And I'm like, oh God, I could have changed her outfit here. Oh, she could have done a different hairstyle. I'm like, no one's thinking about that except me. Because it's funny, because the finished copy is like 79,000 words. But my first draft was 130,000 words. So there's almost half of it that was cut. So I'm like, there's just a lot of material in my head still. Now, what made you choose? You've got the two characters, Grace and Yuki, on literally opposite sides of the country. Was that intentional or? Yes, because I wanted them to have to kind of come together like they're opposites in a lot of ways and they complement each other in a lot of ways so I wanted that to kind of be mirrored in in every aspect yeah I guess it wouldn't have been the same if one was in Philly and one was in New York yeah she's like a drive up yeah yeah train ride yeah so why did you choose those specific locations though honestly I don't know um I just I really like the Pacific Northwest just for like just the aesthetics and vibes and just like when I pictured Grace and and like studying astronomy in this area and her and her tea shop and they kind of carved out their own little space in in very white Portland. Um, And then New York was 
kind of a given, mostly because I, after Maryland, that's kind of where I have the most experience in a state. Um, and so I know it pretty well. Um, and so I wanted, it was, it was easy for me to kind of put Yuki and her friends there and have them kind of feel at home in New York, so. It's kind of a great juxtaposition too, because those are two very different cities, New York and Portland. If you've done New York and LA or, yeah, you know, it, it, like you said, the, the topography, the climate, everything is quite unique and different in their own ways. Yeah, like Grace talks about like the redwood trees and the rain and he's like, there's no trees here. <laughs> Right, and I guess it's kind of a culture shock for Grace when she comes to New York and has to get used to all the, the differences, the sounds, yeah. people, yeah. The, you know, everything is different. Ooh. Yeah, like she has her, her culture moment when she's in Harlem with Yuki and there's like the the um, soul food restaurant and then there's like the hair salon and she can like smell like, you know, when you go past the hair salon, you know you have the hair grease, the steam from the hot comb, like it's like a visceral feeling. And so like to have that, as soon as you touch down in this place you've never been to is like, that kind of seals the deal for like, this is where I, I was supposed to do this. Well, I do want to open up to all of our viewers. If you have a question, um, please feel free to put that in the chat. We'd love to get those questions asked. Uh, Miss Vivian did ask, why did you name your book Honey Girl? It wasn't an initially named Honey Girl. It was named something very, I don't even remember what it was, but it was very scientific and cerebral and pretentious, really. And my agent was like, we can't sell this. <laughs> we can't do it. Um, and so I got Honey Girl because that's what Yuki calls Grace. And the book, like Grace is on the cover. She's the center of the story. You follow her journey. She's, you know, the it of the book. Um, and Honey Girl kind of captures everything about Grace Porter um, in this story. So, and it's marketable. It is a great name. <laughs> I don't know what your original name was. It but... was something so wild. I don't know what I was thinking. And shout out to Holly for being like, absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely not. Well, it looks like that was our only question, but if you would like to ask questions, um, we have a few more minutes left, so feel free to put those in the chat. Well, thinking about your next book, um, mm -hmm. are you, I know you, you're you just getting underway, but are you thinking of a particular region to set that one and thinking about how much you know Maryland, or is it kind of boring to set it in Maryland when that's the project? on the phone with one of my, my again my friend that used to live in new york and we were talking about this the book i'm writing now and it's set once again in the pacific northwest which i've never ever been to and she's like okay you're never gonna have to go there now because you keep saying books there and i'm like yeah so this one's gonna be in washington state never been never laid eyes on it but i, th I just feel like the weather is better. Like you don't get that kind of Maryland summer humidity. Like you can be on the coast, but not like burn to a crisp. I feel like with your language skills though, like describing the sweaty Maryland heat, like you could do a lot with that. I just, everyone would know how miserable I am. <laughs> I think that would be honest. I think we're all miserable at that time. <laughs> Like every, I know people have like the um, seasonal depression for winter and when it gets dark early. I thrive in the darkness. Summer now, I'm like, don't even talk to me. Don't look at me. This is my period of mourning. Um, it's really, I'm, I'm really doing terribly right now. And I can see, you know, I'm from Maryland as well. How looking at the Pacific Pacific Northwest, it just seems so majestic and different and yeah misty and yeah and I, yeah, I have to confess I haven't been there either but I have all these I, ideas I don't know that anyone on the, in the Pacific Northwest is like I would love to visit Maryland <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know that anyone has that dream um to come here I mean you know we're okay <laughs> so yeah 
Well, that's good to know. I wish you luck with your next book. And of course, you know, the times are so strange and you definitely, none of us want to turn into a Grace Porter, um, exactly. especially if you know better. Exactly. I have a question from Audrey. What compelled you to make Grace's dad a military man? Well, I want, I knew that relationship was going to be strained and I knew they were going to have this kind of communication issue. And once I was digging into Grace, right, and she's very dedicated, she's very detail-oriented, rigid and structured. And I'm thinking, what would make a person this way? What in their upbringing would inspire this? Um, <clears throat> so that's how I kind of came to her, her dad kind of being this very rigid, upright um, military guy. Um, and that kind of feeds into how he interacts with her. He calls her Porter, like he, like she's one of his soldiers. Um, like he's still kind of in that, that war mindset. Everything is a battle. Um, so it definitely really fit him. I like the juxtaposition you had between the, uh, Grace's mother and father. The mother's like floating away on the wind, doing you know yeah, whatever yeah. she wants, and the wow, it's firmly rooted. Yes, and Grace has both of them in her. Um, you know, she she wants to stay on her course and and get to the end, but she also wants to run away. She has, I think, the worst qualities of her parents um, kind of manifest in her. She has to figure out how to kind of overcome them, or at least live with them in a way that's healthy. So. So when you had the the your initial draft, which was much longer, did you have additional characters, or was it just more? God no, there's already too many. There's already <laughs> way too many. <laughs> no, there was just more scenes, definitely like more banter. Um, I have a great editor, and she was like, "This is unnecessary. What is? What are you saying here?" So I, you guys talk about like it being very lyrical and poetic, but she definitely saw the parts. And she was like, what does this say? This this is an entire page that says nothing. And I was like, you're right. You're right. OK. So it definitely was like honing it um, and, and actually making these very pretty words actually mean something and say something and, and move the story forward um, instead of just being there to look nice. So did all those years of fandom writing set you up so that you weren't, you know, just slayed by your editor just Cutting it down. With no, I I was I was well prepared because um, I have friends who were definitely always like, "Here you go again," <laughs> and I was like, "This is me." So I'm I'm very used to people being like, "Please fix this," and sometimes I do, and sometimes I don't. Um, so <laughs> yeah. Well, that just reiterates how important that collaborative process is, even though it is your book. It yeah. You know, if you want other people to read it and take things away from it, I guess getting input from them helps. And of course, your editor is very important. Yeah, because no one writes like a perfect book ever, but especially not the first time. Um, so having an agent, because I went through agent edits first. And so my agent was like, let's do something here. No, she. one of the notes was actually to add more romance. So I think... Uh, the romantic element. I told you romance is really hard to write. So she was like, let's actually make this romantic this time around. And I was like, okay, got it, got it. So I did that. And then with my editor, Laura, she is definitely um, precise. So able to make every scene count and every line of dialogue um, mean something. So yeah, it's definitely collaborative and it makes it better when you're working with other people. For those aspiring authors out there, what's your advice? Keep writing. Writing is so hard. It, and I don't think that it, it doesn't get easier. I don't believe people when they say it gets easier with each book. Um, it's hard, but I think it's important to find a writing community. Um, and I, cause I don't think writing is a solitary practice. Like, yes, it's you with your computer, but there's other people that are writing and that are, are waiting to encourage you and, and help you fix your plot holes and, and brainstorm. So it, it really doesn't have to be just you um, like on your keyboard. There's, there's people that want to um, like uplift it and make these stories better and then actually make them available. 
because especially like as a as a black queer mm -hmm. author like there's like there's a community here and we want everyone's story to be on the shelf and to find readers um because the more the better like no one just makes it and they shut the door behind them that's not how it works so you kind of always have to usher in the next person um so i think you have to keep writing but you have to find people that you can trust um to get energy from and then you have to give it back to them too you have to be willing to collaborate and and edit and and uplift people as well if you want them to do it for you and you mentioned that writing is so so hard um i agree i've i've never been able to sit down and just continuously write but what do you think is the hardest part of writing a book keep going um, and plot. Like I get, I'm sitting here right now, I probably have 57 book ideas in my head right now, but actually expanding them to, to be able to fill a book, <laughs> no way. So people that are able to just sit down and, and plot out like scene by scene and know what's gonna happen every moment of the book, I'm like, can you just do mine? <laughs> um, so that's, that's, like plotting. That's why I've definitely turned to outlining. I didn't outline for Honey Girl. I didn't know what was going to happen from one scene to the next. Um, so I've definitely gotten into like the save the cat um, and kind of figuring out the different beats in the story. Um, so that's really helpful. But yeah, just figuring out what the story's about and, and writing it is really hard. Draft so those, for me is really difficult. Those authors who pop out a book every year I don't know. I I don't know. I guess they are magic. They are. I don't know. I don't know how anyone does it. I told my agent the other day. I was like, I'm not a year a book a year author. It's just not me. I'm not that girl. Um, and, and I, I feel like I just take a, I take a lot of time with the book. Like it takes mm -hmm. me a while to figure out what it's supposed to be. Um, and for some people that comes so much quicker and I'm like, ugh. for people that can draft in like 30 days, I'm like I'm not even done my outline by then. So yeah. Well, six months is pretty good to, for your first book. Yeah, and that was, was good. Pretty short. To I me. would definitely like to to cut that though. Hone that a little bit. So outlining helps because if you know what happens, you just kind of have to put on the page. Mm-hmm. So are you working with anybody in any of your writing groups right now who's trying to get their first or second or third book published? Yeah, so I do, I have really good writing friends that I found um, in different stages of publishing. So we're all kind of like sharing ideas or we'll do like Zoom writing sessions. Um, we definitely talk and <laughs> more than we write. Um, but yeah, just having someone there um, helps with just accountability and also being like, there's someone else doing the same thing as me. So it doesn't mm -hmm. feel like you're just climbing this mountain by yourself. Yeah, you've got community, you've got you've got people. Yeah, and group chats are immaculate. Everyone, that's my, actually, that's my advice for writers, get a group chat. So you can talk about publishing, you can talk about writing, and you like always have these people there talking with you. And you don't tweet it. You don't tweet all your thoughts. You have a group chat. That's my advice. <laughs> so very anti-author of you, not <laughs> tweeting all of your thoughts. I don't know. We've all seen it happen. And we're like, you know what? They should have gone to the group chat. <laughs> they should have. So this is advice for all authors, not aspiring yeah. ones. All authors. No one wants to be the main character on social media. Um, and you avoid that by running it by your friends first. And if they're your real friends, they'll tell you, this is bad. We gotta that's, get you together. That's the best advice right there. <laughs> best <laughs> advice I've heard in a long time. Yeah. Well, we are coming up on an hour and that just flew by. This was so great. Um, is there any parting words that you would like to leave viewers with um maybe if you read this book um and i know you asked like what my intended audience was and i guess it's really anyone that sees themselves in any part of this book it is 
for them and I'm glad that it found you. Yeah. Good words to end on. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Morgan, for being with us. This thank was this was great. Me. This was wonderful. I thank keep saying wonderful. Me. That's how I feel about your book. It's <laughs> wonderful. You're so wonderful. I hope that we get to get to have you back at PGCMLS sometime. Yes, sometime please. in the yeah in the soon times, not the not the two year times. If you're not a book a year person, maybe we can. Uh, maybe maybe next year. Maybe next. Yeah. Year. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna hold you to that. Yes. I mean, you have my information now, so I'm here. Yep. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank have you. a have a great evening, everyone. Stay safe. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.